Thank you, Ian. Much appreciated. Yep. <laughs> Those speakers have a mind of their own sometimes. So welcome, uh, friends here, uh, friends joining remotely. Glad you could join this community as we gather together for worship. Today is the first Sunday of Lent, and I was thinking this morning as I was brushing snow off of my car um, that the word Lent means spring. But uh, winter, of course, is reminding us that it's not done with us yet, but we're moving towards spring. And Lent is that season when we move towards spring together spiritually in our lives. It's a season of reflection, a season of preparation for the Easter celebration. So however you choose to use the season of Lent of preparation, um, we're going to be helping you with that, hopefully, during uh, our worship services on Sundays. Just one quick reminder that today, thanks to the Showermans, is uh, soup and bread Sunday, so gather together um, on this still wintry but almost looking spring-like day to, uh, for some warm soup and, and bread. Well, on this first Sunday of Lent, we join together uh, to worship and remember that God is with us um, during this journey. So let's join together in our call to worship. As we begin the season of Lent, let us be led by the Spirit. Even if the path to the promised land leads through the desert, through hunger and doubt and temptation, even if we are led where we would rather not go, yet we choose to be led by the Spirit and end our journey rejoicing in our Lord God. Please stand as you are able and let's sing, all creatures of our God and King.
Hello. Hello. I'm not Arlene. Um, <laughs> she is fine, but is involved in something else. So would you please join me in the prayer of praise? Faithful God, who created us in love, renew us in love as we open our hearts to you in worship. Jesus the Christ, who redeemed this world in love, reclaim our lives as we offer ourselves to you in worship. Life-giving spirit, who moves this world forward in love, move within us as we worship. And now please remain seated as we sing the response, number 630, Fairest Lord Jesus. the ninth beatitude. It's in the Bible somewhere. Blessed are the flexible, for they shall not be bent out of shape. That's right. And I appreciate you guys' flexibility back there in the congregation, too. It's delightful. So one of the ways, one of the uh, symbols of Lent is, is desert. And Jesus went into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights, fasted and prayed. And so one of the approaches to Lent is that of self-giving. Uh, and we're going to hear that in the reading from Philippians 2 in a moment of Jesus um, emptying himself of everything but love. And so our prayer of confession and reflection this morning is based on that as we begin the season of Lent together. Let's pray. Jesus, our Lord and friend, you have told us that life is gained by losing it, giving it away, and letting it go. We confess that these words frighten us, for we are often unwilling to release control. Yet during this Lenten season, we ask that you teach us what it means to let go, 
that we might be embraced by divine love forever beyond our control and forever bountiful in mercy. Let's take a moment for our own silent prayers and reflection. Amen. Friends in Christ, hear this good news taken from a wonderful passage um, from Paul's epistle to the Romans. In all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Receive God's unconditional love and always available love and live in love as God's children. Thanks be to God. We're going to take a moment. We're going to pass the peace, the peace of Christ be with you at home, pass the peace to your friends. But Something we learned to do during COVID, uh, just a quick reminder, just for fun, is we're going to pass the peace with sign language first, all right? Just as a little reminder. So peace is this, put one hand in front of the other, crossed. Either way, it doesn't matter. And so the sign for peace is this, cross, and then do this. That's peace. Of Christ, you just point to your palms where Christ was crucified, so the peace of Christ. With his gentle fists bumped together, and then you. This is plural you. Or if you want to point to someone you, Marilyn, peace of Christ be with you. So let's put it together. Peace. Christ be with you. Let's stand now and pass the peace of Christ with signs, words, um, however you choose to pass the peace to your neighbor.
The scripture reading this morning is from Philippians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. If you've gotten anything at all out of following Christ, if his love has made any difference in your life, if being in a community of the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favor, agree with each other, love each other, be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet-talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death, and the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. This is the word of the Lord. One note, this is, I was reading from the message. Thank you for that, Sharon. That's a delightful rendering of that passage. It's wonderful. So our theme for the Sundays of Lent um, is going to be the seven deadly sins. Woohoo! Are you excited? How many of you heard of the seven deadly sins? Okay, just about everybody. Great. Studied them? Practiced them? Don't raise your hand. Even if you can't name them all, let me tell you up front, we have all enjoyed them to some degree. So here they are in no particular order, Although, except pride is always first on any list you see of the seven deadly sins, and I'll explain why in a moment. So here they are. Pride, wrath, sometimes called anger, but I like the word wrath, um, and we'll talk about that next week. Envy, lust, gluttony, sloth, my favorite, and greed. Now, we're only going to cover six of the seven on Sundays during Lent, since there are only six Sundays in Lent. So I don't have a Sunday in Lent to talk about greed, but that doesn't mean you're off the hook for greed, because I'd like to cover that topic when we return to the parables of Jesus after Easter, because Jesus told a parable of warning about greed and gave some good teaching about generosity the virtue that acts like a vaccine um, against greed. So we'll talk about that after Easter. Now, I want to be clear from the beginning that the point of talking about the seven deadly sins is not to make us feel horrible about ourselves or take us on a guilt trip. Many of us have been on that trip, you know, the guilt trip, several times perhaps, and we find ourselves going back on that trip. Got the t-shirt, took the pictures, don't want to go back again. I have an old friend who uh, once said, my parents were travel agents for guilt trips. <laughs> and I'm done going on those trips. We're not going to do that during Lent. We're not going to pull a Jonathan Edwards from the 18th century who preached a sermon titled, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And the image he used in his sermon is that God is dangling you by a thread over the fiery abyss and could drop you at any moment if you don't repent. That's not what we're about these next few weeks, and that is not the gospel. The goal in this series, and the purpose of the season of Lent, really, is to let the Holy Spirit do the work of renewal in our lives and increase our capacity for love, as, as we've been praying about and singing about already in this service. The word Lent, again, means spring, and spring's purpose is the budding of new life and the renewal of the earth, and that's what this series is about. 
Think of this as tending to the gardens of our lives, removing the decay of winter and preparing for new growth that will be springing forth and emerging from the wintry cold and darkness. This is what we do during the season of Lent. So we're going to invite some self-reflection, as we do during this season, but with the goal of seeking renewal and abundant life, now and after Easter. Which is why, along with the seven sins, we're also talking about the life-giving virtues, the good and positive practices and traits that increase our capacity for love. Which leads to an important piece of background here, a little history and explanation. The concept of the seven deadly sins was developed in the 6th century by Gregory the Great. By the way, what made him great was that he basically saved Christianity from extinction by developing what we know today as monasteries, where Christian documents and biblical manuscripts were taken and were hidden and copied as the Roman Empire fell and was ransacked, and books and scrolls of biblical literature were being burned or destroyed. And not only were books and manuscripts saved, monks prayed and kept the faith as the Dark Ages were coming upon Europe. Were it not for Gregory the Great, we wouldn't have the Bible as we have it today. He wasn't a perfect man. There were some things that he did that weren't great, but this is what he did do. Anyway, earlier in his life, he developed this idea of the seven deadly sins. Now, we know these as the seven deadly sins, and we may wonder, why are they deadly? What makes them deadly? I'm glad you asked. They've been called deadly because Gregory the Great believed that the goal of the Christian life and the mark of the Christian gospel was love. It's the greatest of the Christian virtues and first in the line of the fruit of the Spirit. So the seven deadly sins were called deadly because they squelch love, the cardinal virtue. They're deadly to the love of God at work in our life and deadly to our love of neighbor. And God wants us to know his love and share his love above all. They're not deadly because they'll kill us if we do them. They aren't deadly because God will smite us if we do them. Are we clear on that? They're deadly because they diminish love. They are deadly to God's love growing in us, which is what God wants for us. They clog the flow of love in and out of our lives, and God wants a clear flow of love in our lives for our sake and the sake of neighbor. Therefore, we're going to look at the seven life-giving virtues alongside the seven deadly sins. And the virtues that we're looking at alongside the sins grow love and open up channels for God's love to flow into and out of our lives. And that's the goal of the Christian life. Some writers have described these seven sins as misdirected love, as love gone astray or misapplied. For example, pride could be looked at as love turned inward or misapplied to myself. Gluttony is misapplied love of material goods at the expense of contentment and simple living. Sloth is a love of comfort and ease at the expense of spiritual vitality and flourishing and so on. You get the idea. All of these sins could be described as actually good desires. Underneath them are actually good desires, which have become either disordered, misdirected, or gone to excess. Which is why we need spiritual practices and transparency before God and before our sisters and brothers in community in order to bring these good desires into their proper expression in God. And so we can fully know God's love and express God's love. It all comes back to the love of God in our lives. Well, this morning we begin with pride and humility. And here's our gospel reading today from Luke chapter 18. He, Jesus, also told, us, told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give a tenth of all my income, but the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other, for all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
So we begin with pride. Many of the classic writers say pride is the only real sin, or at least the chief of all the sins, because all the others flow out of pride. So there's a reason that it's first in the list. In John Milton's Paradise Lost, pride is the very nature of the devil. Satan fell because of pride. Unwilling to submit to God's authority and gracious design, he rebelled, believing he knew better than God how to rule. And the famous line from Satan in Paradise Lost is, better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. Pride was at the heart of what we have called original sin. Adam and Eve were tempted by the serpent with these words, if you eat of this, you won't die. You'll be like God. Ooh, that sounds pretty good. And Genesis 3.5 says that when the first human saw that the tree was good, to de- desired to make one wise, they took and ate. There was a desire to be as wise as God or to be as God, rather than live humbly under God's wisdom and authority. But what makes pride such a trap for us is that it's so subtle and can be hard to detect. Where's the line between having a healthy sense of ourselves and being full of ourselves? Between confidence and cockiness. Muhammad Ali's famous line was, I am the greatest. Is that a true statement or a prideful boast? Or both? Or was he just entertaining us? I mean, we've learned that he was actually a really great guy. Let's talk about what deadly pride first is not. It is not the feeling of delight in being affirmed genuinely and truthfully for who you are as a person or for something good that you have done. We're not experiencing the sin of pride when we do something well and feel good about it and are affirmed for it. The phrase, I am proud of myself, can be said with humility and truthfulness. Sinful pride is not that feeling when you have when you're proud of your kids or your grandkids or of your spouse or of your favorite sports team. That can be a good kind of pride. But there's a subtle distinction. When do we cross the line from being genuinely proud of ourselves or of something or someone and ha- to having a self-love that competes with others or even with God? President Lyndon Johnson was known for his grandiosity and his larger-than-life personality. And there was a time when German Chancellor Ludwig Erhard came to the United States uh, when Johnson was president and was visiting uh, Johnson's ranch in Texas. And he said to him, I understand you were born in a log cabin. And Johnson replied, no, no, you you have me confused with Abraham Lincoln. I was born in a manger. (laughs) Was he joking? What is deadly pride? Uh, What does the kind of pride that kills love look like? Let me suggest two ways that pride is often manifested, and you'll think of others too, but here are two substantial ones. One is when I have the need to be right. When I have the need to be right. George Bernard Shaw, that Irish playwright with a great ironic wit, said this once. He said, the longer I live, the more I see that I am seldom wrong about anything, and that all the pains I have so humbly taken to verify my notions have only wasted my time. (laughs) Now, that may have been his Irish uh, wit. Who knows? Before getting married, I received lots of unsolicited advice. But the only advice I remember was from a friend who had been married a couple years, so still relatively newly married, and he said this to me. It doesn't matter whether you're you're right or wrong, but how you say what you say. Because there is a way of being right that makes you wrong. There's a way of being right that makes you wrong. Does that ring true to you? You know what I mean? Years ago when I, I was on vacation, Heidi and I visited a church, and the sermon title for the morning was, Do You Want to Be Right or Do You Want to Be Well? Since then, I've heard several versions of that. Do I want to be right or do I want to be happy? (laughs) Do I want to be right or do I want to have relationships? Now, along that line, one of the points made in the sermon was that when we need to be right, it isolates us from others, and it makes us lonely people. Like the Pharisee in Jesus' parable, Jesus points out that he was standing by himself. That's an important and easy-to-miss part of the story. He's alone in his feeling of superiority. 
In 1 Corinthians 13, that famous love chapter, uh, which is often associated with weddings and, and, and such, but it's not a text about marriage. It's part of a letter written to a church that was st struggling with issues of pride, spiritual pride and feeling su superior to others who weren't manifesting the spiritual gifts like they were. So the, the Apostle Paul has to remind them, if I speak in the tongues of humans and of angels and have all the spiritual gifts and all knowledge, if I'm smart and eloquent and witty and right, but don't have love, it means nothing. I'm just fingernails screeching on a chalkboard, you know. I'm a muffler dragging on the ground behind a car. And then we get to those lines where Paul says, love is patient. Love is kind, love is not arrogant or boastful or rude. And then he says, love does not insist on its own way. And the emphasis there is on the word insist. There's nothing wrong with des desiring to do things our way or thinking we might be right or, hey, I think I have a good idea. But love and humility suggest that others might be right too. And maybe my way isn't the only way or the best way. Love and humility may mean believing that I'm right, but seeing that the way I'm being right is wrong. Deadly pride, the kind that kills love, is when I need to be right or insist on having things my way. Now, the truth is, it, it's a good and legitimate thing to be right. And many of us are right <laughs> about many things much of the time. It's just when my need to be right becomes more important than my decision to love and be loving that I probably need to ask God for help. And rereading and reading that passage from Philippians that Sharon read for us would be a good place to begin. A second manifestation of pride is when I compare myself to others and find myself superior, or I find others inferior. That's the sin of pride that Jesus is describing in the parable he tells in Luke 18. Here's a presumably good and righteous man, and there's nothing wrong with his piety or his life. His problem is, is that he compares himself to someone else and finds himself superior and the other inferior. In the old Latin translation of the Bible, the one that the Catholic Church has used uh, since forever, the word we translate into English as pride is in Latin superbia. Not suburbia. There's a lot of sin that happens in suburbia too, but, um, but superbia. Uh, meaning, uh, it means above. The word itself is wonderfully self-explanatory, isn't it? I am superb, in a not-so-humble way. C.S. Lewis, from his book, Mere Christianity, explains it well. He says, pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only out of having more of it than the next person. We say that people are proud of being rich or clever or good-looking, but they are not. They are proud of being richer cleverer or better looking than others. It is the comparison that makes you proud, the pleasure of being above the rest. Once the element of competition has gone, pride is gone. That is why I say that pride is essentially competitive in a way that the other vices are not. So this was the problem with the Pharisees, who not only thought that they were better than others, but believed that God thought that they were better than others. And that's when pride becomes most deadly when I believe that God has favorite children, and I believe that I'm one of them. Jesus' moral of the story at the end of his parable is, all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. Which leads to the uh, antidote to pride, the vaccine, if you will. Since COVID, I, I like that image of a vaccine. It's really relevant and contemporary. So the vaccine against pride is humility. Humility is in many ways the opposite of pride. But I'd like to put this in different terms for us, because we can't really say, I'm going to be humble now. That kind of sounds prideful, doesn't it? <laughs> when we begin to use the word humble about ourselves, you know, we've lost it, in a sense. Because humility isn't so much a virtue, something you strive for, like faith, hope, and love. Humility is more like a side effect, uh, or a character trait, of people who are right-sized about themselves who seek to have an honest and accurate view of themselves, not thinking less of themselves or putting themselves down, but being right-sized and truthful. And that's a good definition of humility, being right-sized about ourselves, both the good and the positive, being honest about that, but also the shadowy side too, and knowing that we are loved by God as we are. So we don't have to 
puff ourselves up or put anyone down, including ourselves. We're all in this together. We're on level ground as human beings. During Advent, we always read that passage from Isaiah 40, that every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill made low and the rough places made plain at the Lord's coming. And so Isaiah is proclaiming that at the incarnation, Jesus came to be on level ground. You heard that in the Philippians reading, too, in a wonderful way, with all of us, and that everyone, every human being is on level ground together. And Jesus modeled that for us during his life. God doesn't want us to feel put down or see ourselves as less. That isn't true humility. God simply wants us to be honest and truthful about who we are, the good and the bad. And in doing so, he builds us up in love, in a process of becoming our real and true self. Put another way, humility means being down to earth, just being down to earth about ourselves. If pride is up here, you know, in the clouds, trying to be above others, trying to climb the caterpillar pillar. If you know that book, Hope for the Flowers, this is a wonderful image of them climbing on top of each other to get higher up. Humility is being grounded in reality, down to earth. In fact, the word humble or humility comes from the word hummus or humus or however you pronounce that, which means earth, ground, rich, fertile soil, because that's where actually the growth happens. Humility is being down to earth grounded in reality about ourselves and about God. But more than that, true humility is cultivated when we take our eyes off of ourselves and focus on serving and loving others. Humility happens when I see others not as people to compare myself to or compete with, but as people whom God loves and whom Jesus came to save. So the real antidote to pride is love, loving and serving others. And by the way, here's a spoiler. Love is the antidote to all of the seven deadly sins. And love is manifested in a rich variety of ways, as we will see. Paul reminds us of this in Philippians 2, as we heard, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others more than yourselves. Not better than, but just consider others. Look not only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. And he reminds us that our example is Jesus who, though he was in the form of God, did not require, um, regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born as a human being. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And during the season of Lent, we are invited to take up our cross with Jesus and follow and be reminded of the way of love of which we now sing. Let's stand and sing together the gift of love.
Please pray with me, and we'll join together in the Lord's Prayer. And there will be some space uh, in the prayer for you to lift up um, silently or out loud any concerns, persons, situations that you would like to pray for together. Please pray. Lord, as we begin this Lenten journey, we hear your invitation to follow. Help us to take the risk of looking within and looking beyond ourselves to the joy and new life that awaits us in the Easter season. Give us hearts of courage and strength to take up our cross and follow you this Lenten season. Walk with each of us as we move from the winter of discouragement to the spring of hope. Cleanse our spirits and make us truly ready to follow where you lead, even if it is a difficult path for a time. God of passion, God of love, in this time of Lent, we realize the pain and suffering in our world. Jesus, you were called the suffering servant, and you come near to those who suffer. You know the anguish of human lives. As one who sees the pain of those who suffer here and around the world, bring comfort, peace, and strength to the suffering. As one who has experienced the agony and tears of losing loved ones, Comfort all who grieve. As one who understands the agony of those who have been deserted, stand alongside those who feel alone and abandoned today. As one who knows the ravages of violence, bring peace and healing to those who have been wounded by others or by life. Jesus, during your life, you offered up prayers with loud cries and even tears. Hear us when we do the same. We approach your throne of grace with boldness. May we receive mercy and grace in our time of need. And now hear us as we lift to you persons and situations weighing on our hearts today uh, that we would like to lift to you now, to your light and to your goodness. For a peaceful resolution to the war in Ukraine. Thank you, God, that you hear the, the cries of our hearts and in our voices. And now hear us as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn together.
now go in peace, and as you go, may the grace of Christ attend you, the love of God surround you, and the Holy Spirit keep you, that you might live in faith, abound in hope, and grow in love now and forevermore. And all of God's beloved said, Amen. Amen.